Hi everyone. My topic today is common deficiencies related to LC and GC methods in Type 2 DMF submissions. Sections S4.2 and 4.3 are critical to assess the quality of analytical methods that in turn influence the overall quality of a DMF submission. LC and GC are the most common techniques to measure the assay organic impurities, residual solvents in the drug substance. DMF holders may develop and validate their own methods to reflect impurity profiles due to different manufacturing process for the same drug substance or use a compendium method when available. Due to the large amount of data generated, the section S4.3 can be very complicated. My presentation today is to discuss commonly observed issues related to LC and GC methods, including easily correctable issues, common issues related to method procedures and validation. And the goal of this presentation is to present expectations from CMC perspective. The following are a couple of slides summarize the most commonly observed and easily correctable issues related to the master procedures, such as referencing a compendium master without providing a description of the master procedures. The analytical master description provides much needed information for assessment, including mobile phase preparation, standard and sample solution preparation, chromatographic conditions, system seal acceptance criteria, calculation formula, Etc. No information regarding the name of manufacturer and the brand of the analytic column are commonly observed in the submission, especially when referencing a compendium method. As we know, the analytical column has a significant impact on the analytical results. For instance, for C18 HPRC column, different manufacturers or even different brands from the same company may perform significantly different such as changing the peak order, peak shape, peak resolution. So providing such information in the submission is important. USP 621 requires system suitability to be demonstrated throughout an entire analytical run. This means the injections used for establishing system seal in the beginning also need to be resubmitted after the last injection of the test sample. We see a lot of cases of misusing the unit of PPM, while the firm actually means microgram per mil, they're different. For example, for same impurity standard solution prepared at the concentration of one microgram per mil, relative to a 100 milligram per mil sample solution we call, the impurity standard solution is at 10 ppm. However, if the concentration of the sample solution increased to 1000 milligram per mil, the impurity standard solution is then called at the 1 ppm level. Other easily correctable issues include no caution statement in the method when special sample handling is needed, especially for some highly hygroscopic API, unstable standard and sample solutions. Missing the reporting threshold information in the method is common. Multiple sample preparations or multiple injections are allowed. However, Firms should clearly state how the generated results will be used and what are the criteria to accept such results. Each analysis not only should meet the spec, but also the difference between two analyses should be clearly defined. On this slide, I will lay out some common issues related to the method procedures. System suitability is a critical element of a validated method that is intended for daily routine analysis. Failure of meeting such criteria indicates the system is not functioning correctly. That could be due to a lot of reasons, like the column, detector, HPRC pump, etc., and ultimately invalidate the generator results. The following are some issues when setting up the system seal acceptance criteria such as personal RSD of standard injections is not tightened per USP 621. The USP 621 has a table showing the recommended personal RSD of standard solution injections. Depending on the upper limit of SA, as well as the number of repeated injections of standard solution. 
However, many firms do not follow that guidance. Demonstration of the instrument's sensitivity is also important, as the levels of impurities and residual solvents in the final API are usually low. Peak separation is critical to accurately quantify the impurities and the residual solvents. Thus, the peak resolution between critical pair of peaks should be defined in the system suit. Peak tailing impact the peak integration and should be included in the system seal, especially when using an isocratic method, while peak broadening and peak tailing are more severe. We often see firms attempt to set up loose system seal, while their validation data indicates that could be much tighter. We will then ask the firm to tighten or justify the proposed system seal acceptance criteria. Other issues include incorrectly using a chromatographic purity as the potency for the reference standard which is intended for assay or impurity quantification. Slightly modifying the chromatographic condition of an official method are generally acceptable. However, the modification has to be within the validate or verified range. When adopting a compendium method, it's quite common. The firm chooses a different brand of the column, but with the same stationary face. As we know, different brands of columns, even from the same company, may perform dramatically different. Thus, using a different column requires demonstration that two different columns can deliver comparable results. I'm now presenting a case study which is related to modification of HPLC conditions. A firm proposed to increase the injection volume to achieve the required sensitivity. The impurity content is determined by percent peak area. There are two main concerns to this scenario. The first is whether the previously validated linearity range still applies as changing this injection volume actually changes the amount of sample loaded on the column, which may change the previous linearity range because the column may perform differently based on the loaded sample amount. And the second is whether the RF of each specified impurity changes or not. So we ask the firm to revalidate the linearity range. We calculate the RF of each impurity per the slope ratio and then revalidate the measure accuracy. From the results summarized in the table below, it shows that except the impurity 4, the RFs of other impurities exceed the range of point A to 1.2. Therefore, the correction factors needs to be introduced in the calculation formula, while the previous calculation has no RF correction. So this is the case related to changing a column while using the same USP method. The top chromatogram is obtained from using a USP column, and the bottom is a chromatogram from a firm picked column. So they are all selecting columns. It clearly shows that the USP column provided a better separation. We consider firm's method will not perform the same unless the column equivalency has been demonstrated. Even after demonstration of column equivalency, validation of the column robustness on different lots is also suggested. Now we are heading to another type of common issues related to method validation. We usually found that the firm just directly use a compendium method without providing the method verification report. However, verification of a compendium method prior to use is required according to USP 1226. Another common deficiency is, when changing methods, firms did not demonstrate the method equivalency that can be either replacing an in-house method with a compendium method or vice versa. In this situation, we usually request a one-time method equivalency study 
to determine if lesser bridging factors need to be introduced when changing the method in order to connect the data generated by the two methods. This actually affects the assessment on stability data. This is another case study showing the comparison between a USP method and an in-house method. The chromatogram at the top shows peaks of impurity 3 and 4 are well separated from the main peak, while the peaks of impurities 1 and 2 are not separating very well. The chromatogram at the bottom shows the peaks of impurities 1 and 2 are baseline separated. However, peaks of impurity 3 and 4 are partially merged to the main peak, which is highly unfavorable. This table shows the real results obtained by the two methods. As you can see, they are significantly different. The firm then decided to adopt the USP method after this study. We sometimes find the firm choose a UV detection wavelength which is too specific, like using the wavelengths above 300 nanometer for an impurity HPLC method without providing adequate justification. As we know, under that wavelength, some impurities or degradants may be undetected. According to ICHQ2, the detection limit or quantitation limit can be estimated by calculation or extrapolation. However, these estimates should be confirmed by other measurements such as signal-to-noise ratio, percent RSD of replicated injections of the DL and QL solution. But most of the time, unspecified impurities are determined by against the drug substance standard. Therefore, firms not only need to validate the linearity range for the assay, but also the linearity range for impurities that are present at a much lower level. For a related substance method, using a very clean API sample to validate method precision, intermediate precision, and robustness is a commonly observed deficiency. As there is no reportable impurities, the results all look the same. We prefer using a crude or a spiked API sample for such a demonstration. Another issue is, some firms like provide a lot of raw data in the validation report, which are not necessary. For instance, using peak area to show measure robustness which is actually irrelevant because significant change of the peak area is expected due to change of the pH of mobile phase, flow rate, column temperature, etc. Raw data only need to be provided per request and should be supported to the method validation. Forced degradation study is used to assess whether the assay and the impurity methods are stability indicating by simulating the worst scenario of degradation. Common issues about the forced degradation study include inadequately stressed or overly stressed sample, not the same stress sample analyzed by the assay and the impurity methods, and no discussion on an obvious mass imbalance. This slide shows an example of mass imbalance observed for thermal stressed API. The assay values was around 83%, while the total impurities measured were only 2.6%. The reviewer's concern is, if there are some degradants undetectable by this impurity method. So the firm was asked to investigate the root cause of this significant mass imbalance. The investigation report shows a late 
eluding peak at 35 minutes that was never detected by the old method. Therefore, a new method was developed and validated using the HPLC column with a different stationary phase. This table shows the mass balance is acceptable for the new method. For a method intended to detect a trace level of genotoxic impurities, firms often push the limit of sample solubility to increase the detectability. And sometimes the API sample is not totally dissolved. To validate method accuracy, for drug substance can be totally dissolved. Spiking the impurity stock solution to the drug substance sample is acceptable. However, if the drug substance is only partially dissolved, this strategy cannot be used as the impurities are already dissolved in the solution, which does not reflect the actual sample preparation procedure due to lack of demonstration of extraction efficiency. Therefore, a simulated sample is appropriate in this case. This slide shows a case of validating sample preparation procedures for a partially dissolved API. An RSMS was developed to quantify GTIs at a single digit PPM level. The API sample cannot be completely dissolved due to the limited solubility. The method accuracy was originally validated by spiking the API sample with a GTI stock solution, as discussed before. The extraction efficiency of the sample preparation needs to be validated since the GTIs are already in the solution. So the firm was requested to use a simulated API sample. The firm agreed to use a simulated sample and revalidated the method accuracy. As you can see in the table, the recoveries at the quantitation limit are from about 76% to 101%, and the recoveries at the spec limit are from about 93% to 107%. The results are deemed acceptable from an analytical perspective. Therefore, firm's method is deemed suitable for the intended use. This slide includes some reference related to my presentation. This concludes my today's presentation, and thank you all for your attention.